Hi there, this is Jim the Keys bartender coming to you from Key Largo. I'm here with Papa Joe. Say hey, hi, Papa Joe. We're here. Yeah, I, I still... The reason I go with Papa Joe is that's what... That's what he's stuck with. Jenna, yeah. Jenna, he's stuck with me. Yeah, we're the same, same age. So, um, today, um, I'm just going to call this getting fucked up. Not that I'm getting fucked up right now, but no, uh, the, the impression not. of the keys. But uh, we are, uh, last week, two gentlemen from, what's the name of that? Some in, From Michigan. Uh, the, I know the name of the vodka. It's called Gypsy Vodka. And it's Michael and Adam. Kazanowski, uh, Kazanowski from Gypsy Vodka. That is Potoski, Michigan. Potoski, Mi- Michigan. Uh, they also, uh, the, so they're the distiller of Gypsy Vodka. The name of the company is High Five Spirits. They came in. They had some nice shirts. They had a whole bunch of stuff. They they look well promotable, and I'm going to be talking to them. I they gave me a bottle of their vodka and a bottle of their gin. Um, I'm just finishing up the vodka right now. Hey, uh, when did they give you this? Last week. Wow. They need to give you another one. This one's got a problem. It's empty. It's empty. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, a week. That's not bad. Do you know? Um, and, and Abby's been drinking that too. Oh, okay. So. We'll blame her too. So, uh, I, I put a big dent in that though, but it's been about, it's about six days, I think. Yeah. A new product, you know? Yeah. Yep. And if it tastes good, why not? Yep. And I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to overdo it, so and I figure I'm going to have this one drink, and then later on we're going to have some uh, cocktails when we do our uh, other shows. Trying to do three shows today. Um, I hope I hope uh, we're Yep. So getting fucked up. The Keys have a reputation for being a party spot, much like yeah, Las lots. Vegas, exactly. Um, all, all across the United States, you have Fort Lauderdale. Uh, that's more of a, uh, I guess all these things. All these shore communities have it, and. Um, but the keys hold a, a place where people kind of like check out. That used to be the only, you know, they would check out of society. You know what the I mean? Keys Just, has always had, I think, in my experience, yeah. um, had that aura around it where if you want to get away, you don't have to go very far if you're if you're in Miami, yeah. for instance. Or that same message is promoted throughout the United States, probably around the world. Yeah, that the keys. The Keys is not like any other place, and in many regards, it's not. And so you have people that visit, probably with different, looking to do different things, or mm-hmm. and they're walking away with probably different experiences having been down. I don't think everyone walks away with the same. Some would probably feel, well, this place wasn't much of a. Oh, game. I've had people like, come in. I've had people come in uh, where. They're visiting and they show up and they had the same. I'll give you my expectations after a while, but for me, it was, uh, these people coming in and are already fucked up and they come in the bar and they start ordering shots and stuff. I said, you are fucked up. You're not having shots. You got fucked up someplace else. I'm going to deal with the, I'm dealing with that, the repercussions of, what you decided to do with its other place, and then you came here. Right. Well, we're going to eat. I said, well, you should be eating and not drinking anymore. Well, we're, it's the keys. Get the, oh, God. Yeah, like this. And that's what they look at I me. Mean, they yeah. give me a look and they go, it's the keys. You're right. It's different expectations. Yeah, and you go like this. I said, well, no, nope. we have the same law, laws about intoxication as the rest of the state. Yeah, but don't you find that when you're on vacation, I'll use myself as yeah. one. Um, I learned a long time ago traveling. I traveled a lot as a kid, a young adult, mm-hmm. you know, and I continue to travel quite yeah. a bit. And leisure travel specifically. You go somewhere and you're completely away from home. And in some people's minds, you're away from responsibility. You're away from rules. You're away from all those things that connect you to that reality of responsibility. I get it. I get it. And the problem is you end up with people like that that come into the bar that they've been drinking who think, well, I'm a tourist. I'm allowed to do this. Well, yeah, you are, but you're also going to end up in jail if you well, that, drive and drink, you know, and all the rest of the stuff. It I, follows you. I, I want to um, I want to thank uh, my lucky star sometimes. And we'll go through my story, but. I, I did over the weekend. I do see people, the locals and, and, and vacationers, they come in and on, um, you see them on Friday, they're getting primed up, you know, they come in. 
uh, were one of the stops. They started drinking already. Probably they start rolling in. You got people coming at the happy hour crowd. They're coming from work, right? And okay. they're getting their first couple drinks. That's different. And then you got the people come in and they want to eat early because they're going to they're gonna have a big night ahead of them. A lot of drinking going on and stuff like that or whatever they're doing. So then you had the people that were happy hour someplace else coming in and coming in to eat. You know, we got our music going and stuff like that. And they're, they're having a good time. And I'm not making fun of anybody. I'm just saying this is the, the pattern that you see. Right, right. And obviously we make our money off of that. And these people, when they're coming in uh, to eat later, they already had, they've been through their happy hour. They've been someplace else and they're coming in here and we're just part of the way station. They're not even, we're not, uh, their end trip no, at you, nine o'clock at you, night. You're just a point on a line with, yeah, and it ends points. up, and yeah. well, the one, it usually ends up maybe at home, but I think there's probably another place for the younger people around here. It's either Sharkies or CJs for, uh, the older people. It's the uh, Caribbean club. Yeah, but even a little even, further south, you got the hog. Um, oh, the hogs are real young people, I guess. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's that's like... Well, that's CJ. Place. And CJ's is, if you're looking for a fight. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I go to CJ's often, and um, I'm Lane. surprised I've not... Uh, I've seen a few erupt, mm -hmm. and I'm very happy to say that... Uh, I don't know what it is about because that. It's lo well, because it's locals mostly. I don't know, because we have, locals, we have locals. We have locals that... Mm, not... But yeah, but you have, you have a different clientele. Oh, yeah, well, but but I think it has to do, and this is where I'm a believer in feng shui, feng shui, the design of it. It's very narrow going in there, and there's things people can't get away from each other. You got the people in the back of the room and the people in the front and all that stuff. It's just like... It could, you know, that'd be interesting to do. Like I, I know, it's just the way, just the way people come in. You know, does just the same. space, does the environment alter the behavior? Now we're going to have that conversation. Yeah. Well, and I always, hey, I, I hey. had to believe. I remember the movie The Warriors. Yeah, of course. Um, there were stories about it when they first came out that there was always fights breaking out after the Warriors, right? And especially in the suburban neighborhoods and stuff like that. Same thing happened in uh, Rocky. Yeah. Well, well, the Warriors, the Warriors, Warriors, because it was gangs, right? A Rocky, I don't know, man. I never yeah, got that vibe. I grew up in Philly. Their oats, and the same thing. With I didn't the see right. You go back, Warriors. Further, I know, Why? and you can go West Side Story, dance fighting. Yes, well, it was identity. It has nothing to do with the fighting. It has to do with group identity. So if you group identify with a character or a group yeah. of characters, you're going to walk away. With this over exaggerated sense of pride, uh -huh. and and then that's what you end up with. Oh, yeah. Warriors, you end up with. This is my group. You're your group. Hey, lucky I wrote this stuff down because we can bring it down, bring it back to that thing. I do believe in the group identity thing, and the thing I was getting to about the weekend is how people go into it. And you see, I work a double Friday, Saturday night, Sunday night, and I see the whole progression, and I see the same people. <laughs> Uh, I see them, but they show up. And on Sunday, there's some of these people, they are fucking done. They are ripped up. I don't even say ripped up. They're, they're drunk, but they're just at the end. They're still drunk and they go, give me a soda. I mean, they drank so much. That's it. I'm done. And you go, man, this is your going into the week. This is your lead up. People say, yeah, it's Friday. And at the end of the, on Sunday, you're so banged up. Like, I'm banged up on a Monday because I had Martini Monday last night. Uh, actually, uh, Jen and Tyler came in, but they good. couldn't even, there was no room at the bar. It was, it was a pretty good night. It was, oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. It was a pretty good night, but, um, yeah, I'm banged up not from drinking, but serving drinks. Right. So I'm, I'm looking at these people and I say, you know what? I'm not, I don't feel I'm any different than they are. That would very easily, that would be me. But I see it now, and I go, wow. Like, I have Tuesday off. I almost, you saw what right happened right now, of right previous to the thing, that uh, the uh, universe uh, aspired against my evening off <laughs> <laughs> by a phone call just before we started this podcast. I get a phone call from some, a coworker of mine who's not feeling well, and this is what happens. I guess, because... You know, you, you think you might feel better during the day and you start getting worse and you realize you got to call out. Um, that me, happens. Yeah. For me, um, 
yeah, what I'll try to do is uh, tonight I we got I can't I can't do this of even though even though I will gauge this you Jenna and Tyler and Damon have ver- are very flexible. Uh, I felt that we were prepared to do it tonight, and I feel obligated to myself and to you, Tyler and Jenna, to do carry through on that time and not go and do that because it's 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 a show. Are we just doing it, or we're going to do it for something bigger, and we're going to do something bigger than fuck it? I got to go and do it, right? I can't just do it. I mean, fuck, would I blow up uh, if I was still? I mean, I was going to say still dating Abby. I am dating Abby. I'm with Abby. I'm you're always dating. You always uh, if, if and the words of advice to any of you guys and 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 girls in a relationship. Uh, when you're formalized it, you're living together, married, whatever, you're still dating. If you remember that, you can have a better relationship. I have to remember that because you're still auditioning for a long-term relationship. Yeah, every day should be an audition. Yeah, it's, the, it's, the, yeah. it's the recipe for a yeah, healthy and, relationship. And, and, the, and the weekend, the part of my weekend is I, I need to be away from work. Yep. I need to be away from work. I know I'm the. I know I advertise myself as uh, a keys bartender. Remember, it's that determiner in front yeah, of it. You don't. Not the it. keys you know, bartender. You don't. You know. You don't have a bed in the middle of the place. Mm. Two weeks ago, it did seem like that because someone was away, and I had to do work. instead of seven shifts. I had to work uh, ten. But you, listen, you do what you got to do, but then those circumstances for you have to take be taken into consideration too. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Okay. And then I take man, it's just that's yeah. Cool. So, uh, so, so you're that, you're saying that the people come in. Getting back to you, watch people come in between Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, yep. and you see a trend. Dude. Some of them, some of them are in each night. Okay, and but what? And they definitely come Sunday. Yeah, some of them are looking like they almost all of them run yeah. over by a truck, and unless they're like just arriving. There are people that travel on a Sunday, which is a great thing. And there's, uh, and, and the younger people definitely have, you can see the difference in recovery. Older people are tougher, are so much tougher. But there comes with being tougher is about of amount of damage you do to yourself. Yeah. The damage older people do themselves is more long term, more, uh, there's a longer residual effect. I just think when I see it and they do it and they do it all, they party like they're 21, 22. I see some of these older people and go, fuck, man, they got the heart. If you put that type of determination and I've seen younger people like that, but they're, they're, they're completely, they drink themselves a blackout and stuff like that. And they're, they, get, they end up in ERs and stuff yeah, like well. that. Older people, it's it's like some people, you're going to look at them and say, they may, may, they're not going to make it out of their 30s, right? And then some people, they do it so hard and stuff like that, like Keith Richards, and they're fucking still rolling around doing their stuff. Yeah, you see those guys in their 70s, 80s, 80s years? Thank God for good genetics. Oh. You know, listen, you can't bet your, you can't bet your well-being on, on the genetics. Um it's a little irresponsible, don't you think? So that if um, you're out there partying, 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 and now you find yourself, say my age, 56 years old, and I got to go to the bar on a Friday, and I got to go to the bar on a Saturday, and I got to go to the bar on a Sunday, one. If I wasn't, if Abby and Sky weren't in the picture and stuff like that, I would be there and uh, I'd have to question my, well, that's, I'll, I'll tell my, my story yeah, about what I thought about it. They, 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 what are you up to is what I'd be asking. Like, what are you up to? What is it in your life that drives Well, you? actually, what, what my thing was, uh, and uh, uh, I'll tell the beginning of it right now, prior to becoming to the Keys, uh, a very unsatisfying early adulthood, you know, with, I mean, I get introduced. I was drinking when I was young. 13, 14 years old. Then I laid off it for a couple of years because I wanted to, you know, fuck, I want to go to the Naval Academy. So I got my act together, did high school, you know, like a champ. And our president of the National Honor Society played some sports, uh, got great grades, ended up getting a, a Navy scholarship, uh, doing the college thing. And then college, 
alcohol financing. And every time you had a disappointment, I'll tell you, I had a friend waiting for you at the end of the day. Holding a drink? No, the the drink. Oh, the drink. The friend. drink was the friend. Yeah. And uh, that became a, a recipe, a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I'm not taking, hey, listen, I'm like I'm saying, I'm having a drink right now. It's a perspective how you use it. It's just like medicine, right? Yeah. Penicillin's there to, uh, to cure you of some ailments, but if you use it all the time, your body becomes, you know, or the ailment becomes, you know, the, resistant to it and things like that. And it, it becomes less productive. It's, it's like the uh, food pyramid, which we find out later was kind of real fucked up. Yeah. The way they had grain in it and stuff it made it so big on the bottom and dairy and cheese and all the food pyramid was wrong. The vegetables should have been like much bigger yeah. part of it. Protein, very small part of it. And, and those other yeah, fats. Which one of you industries wants to pay us to put you at the top? That's yeah. Kind of where it went. Yeah. Yeah. They, well, they came in, they had the industry. The industry, uh, uh, the person who originally created a food pyramid, I'm going off it, was saying, no, that's wrong. That's the late, you have it. Uh, uh, yeah, but the people that are going to pay for the posters. I gave you, yeah. 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 So, they but. Have interest. But so I, 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 I would call it, I developed the wrong relationship. M- much like having a bad girlfriend or boyfriend. And I, I developed, uh, you can have a friend who may not be good for you as long as you're not taking advice from them, letting them drive the car, making them take the party, stuff like that. I I like to call alcohol the bad friend, the very bad friend. Because you can have a good time with a bad friend when you're out. Yeah, you can. Yeah, but when you go home with them and you got to live with them all the time and you start making your decisions with their advice in your ear and stuff like that, that's when... Everything kind of goes wrong and you have ability. And if you're a person that has a, a, mo- a lot of people have so many talents, talent, they're talented. They have abilities and they're unrealized because his friends keeping them back. His friends keeping them back all the time. You just got to say, you know what? Air on the weekend. You're my friend. Okay. You're my friend on the weekend. I got to go and continue. I got to do this other stuff. And that's what alcohol did me, but I was doing it all the time. That friend was with me all the time. So before I got married, I would, um, oh my God, I was living it. I was on my, I'd, I'd work hard at my job. I do a, I, I do a pretty good job when I jump, but it was always kind of slight. The first half of the day, I'm recovering from the night before. Yeah, sure. And I had physically, constitution wise, I was able to go and do my job, do everything, do it. I had a good attitude, intelligent, do, be able to do my job and adequately being a good, uh, good in the service. Good in working in government, good working in private industry. I was there, I'm a nice guy. And then happy hour at the end of the day, whenever I'm off, there we go. Whenever the drinking light goes on, just like the smoking light on ships when they yeah. had. So I would go and do it. And on my days off, it was built around drinking. It was wherever we went, I was, I was drinking. I mean, I, I, for a couple of years before I got married, I would go and spend practically the whole day at the bar, open to close. Not unheard of. Yeah, I I could never understand. Um, it's just the way that you, draw. I, I could. Well, not. it's a circular. It's a circular. Uh, you you, you, you start on, drinking and something like that, you get on it. You you drink too much. You feel shame. You vow never to do it again. All oh, this hurts course. and hurts well, and stuff. Expects- and, it, and 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 the real problem alcohol has is you know where someone somebody does it. Once a month, and you know, then they go back and do it again. Oh, okay. Oh, the, the real problem drinker does it every day, and they cover up. You get drinking to the shame and drinking to the shame. It's almost going back and forth. Well, into it. addiction. You know, you have your binge addiction. You have you have your chronic addiction. Mm-hmm. Um, and 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 it's not just alcohol. You can binge addict. Uh, I've I've known uh, cocaine users that are binge addictors, uh-huh. um, and they're. There is, it's as toxic a behavior. The binge addiction with, as, ca- as, it, it's not as chemical as the hair, as heroin and cigarettes. Um, as, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, f- no, no, I would say if we're, but, talking- but then again, you know, they've done studies about, I told you about the Vietnam, uh, during the Vietnam War, they expected, uh, towards the end, a lot of addiction specialists, psychiatrists, right. they believe there was going to be a huge, 
influx of heroin addicts in the United States after the uh, Vietnam War because of the prevalence of the use of it because the heroin came, well, came from that, that part. Come, didn't that come true? No, not necessarily. The reintroduction is heroin is important. But the service, a lot of service members were able to stop because they said some of them, when they had a meaning, they used the heroin over in Vietnam for different reasons. So environment. And no, they used it for different reasons, like right, to escape the horror of what was going on around them. And oh, when sure. they came here and they had a purpose, they were able to walk away from it. Now, Obviously, there were people that were heroin addicts over here came over, and but it never that. came to fruition. And they go, and so they had to rethink that that addiction model. And we're not talking about addiction today, and we're, we're going to be uh, let's take that break, and then we'll come right back and we'll talk about what happened. I'm going in bars and stuff, how that changed for me. And I'm not saying I'm, hey, I'm not saying I'm cured or anything, but I'd like to thank once again. We're gonna, uh, I'm gonna make sure the guys that. Uh, High five liquors, gypsy vodka, and high five uh, gin. I'm going to make sure I'm going to pitch. I'm having a drink. It is smooth. It's uh, six times distilled, if I read it correctly. Made from corn and is gluten free. Ooh, it's healthy. Yeah, and distilled in Michigan, Batowski. By USA. By USA. There you go. Make uh, Mava. Make America vodka again. Yeah, that's beautiful. I like yeah, that yeah, one. Mava, Mava. Mava. Okay, we're going to be back in a moment. Whether you're one of our regular visitors to the Florida Keys or you can't wait to visit for the first time, you'll want to stay up to date on everything that's going on in the Florida Keys. To learn all the secrets, tips, and the stuff we don't talk about to anyone but each other, visit 43keys.com. Sign up for our newsletter and never miss any of the exciting things we have planned for you. That's 43keys, the number four, the number three, keys.com. And we're back. So I think we'll get them to just stick them two together here. Yeah, it's a slight technical problem. Yeah, yeah, but this is getting fucked up. I'm not getting fucked up, but nah, yeah. and we left it off. I was talking about, you know, going to the bar all day and I decided I didn't want to be I was doing this cycle, doing this. I was uh living at home, living I mean, I was I, I, I was every, every opportunity I had to go forward in any career or relationship, I would fucking sabotage it by just getting fucked up at the wrong time, getting fucked up all the time. And then I ended up, I said, I met the girl I dated at one time. Again, I said, and I was terrified at the time. I'm thinking about, I had my, my father had a cousin who I don't think he ever got married. And my dad, and they started saying they, I reminded them, ended up having a kid, but it was outside of wedlock. And the kid had a drinking problem too, who was around, was a little older than me, I guess. And he ended up living by himself in downtown Philadelphia, even though they lived in the suburbs. He moved down to an apartment down there. I'm just drinking every day, smoking, had one of those, uh, trakes, trakes in, yeah. always talked to, and, uh, and then I had one of my, mother's uncles who was a world war ii vet and he never married and he was drunk all the time had a cirrhosis belly and all that stuff but uh, uh and uh he was a nice guy but they always talked about like i i think what happens with um i think you, you heard here in the old days when people went to aa and stuff like that they said i had a problem with you is you can't handle it you can't tough it out. And a lot of times with addiction, you seem to um, live in the past and you drink to your past and you drink. So anything you had, you don't move on. It's frozen. It's like a snapshot. And you just do that stuff. So I was doing that and I was thinking about these uncles. I said, fuck, you know what I need to do? I need to settle down. I decided I was in love with this girl. She's a wonderful girl. She's a lovely, good person, very good person. I ended up uh, proposing to her and ended up being married six years. And we just going to, uh, I, I was drinking during the relationship, but nothing like I was when I was single. I was not drinking like a champ anymore. But I used to sneak every so often. Like I'd have bourbon in there and then I put tea in there. So it looked like I had that. She never drank bourbon. So she wouldn't know. You know, uh, if, if I was out late last night, I would just, I would just 
drink uh, secretly. Like she wouldn't know that I'm drinking bourbon. Right. But, and you would drink this like not just when you got home, but during the day, throughout the day. Oh, not when I'm working. Okay. No. So never drink when I'm working. You got off I never, I never drank at work. Uh, when, when, no, I never drank at work. That, that was one of those things. Everyone, and there are, People say, well, I never do that. I never smoke around the kids. I never do this. I never, but you're equivocating, right? So we're going through marriage counseling and stuff like that. And even while we're in marriage counseling, they'd every so often say, would you say, and they'd even look at me and go, would you say that you drink too much? And she would say, no, I don't think he does. Really? You don't think I drink too much? And even when I, uh, we got separated, she asked me to leave. And I, uh, the year before we got separated, I went on a trip down to the Keys. My, one of my best friends, my best friend at the time, I uh, was in my wedding. He lived down here on a boat. And I was friends also with his brother. And we had a mutual friend, Gary. And we all went, came down to Key Largo for five days. And, uh, I came down and it was so beautiful. You come in, my buddy lived on a boat in a pilot house marina. Oh, nice. They had the bars right there. We're drinking every day. Uh, we go down to Key West. I think I ended up, I don't know how I drew the short straw on this one, but, um, I was the, uh, designated driver coming back from Key West with all them drunk down there. It was funny. They were harassing the shit out of me too. Gary was sticking his feet in my ear and all that. But I, I said, oh, man, it was great. And I'm in a, in a bar, and guys are introducing me to women and all that stuff. Like, oh, wow. And I, my relationship falling falling apart at the time. So this was, that was 2006. And then the beginning of 2007 rolls around eight months later, nine months later, well, whatever. And uh, the wife asked for a separation. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do. Like, what am I going to do? I'm standing here. I said, man, I'm, I hate my job. At the time, and uh, obviously the the marriage isn't going too well, and I, I, we we weren't getting along at all. So I, I wasn't crying over that stuff, and uh, I didn't realize then that she had plans like to move on. And uh, I came down here. I said, they, you know, my friends and I asked, can I come down here? And, so, and she drove me to the airport, blah, blah, blah. And I went down here, uh, you know, took a leave of absence. I was going to come down here for like a couple months, figure out what I was going to do and move on. I was thinking about going to New York, right? So I came down here in about April 2007. And that's five, uh, by August, I was in AA. Oh, God. Yeah, I realized that I had taken all the problems I had in Philadelphia and brought them down to Key Largo. Of course you did. And uh, I stopped for seven years to 2014. And uh, it was beautiful, man. It was a great time. Um, I mean, I can't imagine the trouble I would have gotten into between then and now. But the reaction I had to go at, at certain times you have um, one of the steps is to make amends. And uh, some people were uh, saying what I did was selfish. By doing what? <laughs> By quitting? Um, no, some of the things I did, like moving down here, leaving, and then my brother, I mean, a couple of years later, some of, uh, one of my relatives said, you left your wife, and I said, wait a second, wait a second. She is married with a new husband and a baby along the way. She moved on. She moved on. I said, that, that didn't happen. That happened a couple months after a while, I was still getting my head together, and that that stuff was going on then. Now, yeah, I was dating and stuff like that. I wasn't, and um, I was actually, I um, was reluctant. I was thinking about, oh, man, I didn't want to end up going back into that relationship because I said, you know, it was just too much. I'd have to rebuild everything, and I don't know if it were, I was a different person at that time. <clears throat> and someone said, well, you you should see if you can. There's any remnants left, and it turned out she was... She didn't want to hear any of it, no, well, but she was still that. my friend uh, after that, but she didn't want to hear any of that. So um, that's good. So I just stayed down here. And uh, that, so when you came down here. Yeah. And so now you're down here. You're, you got your friends, you, you're drinking, then, then it ends up. I became a bartender. You became a bartender. It ends up having to be a problem. You abstain uh, until 2014. I abstain. I worked at it. I worked. Oh, no, at no, it. there's no uh, doubt. Anyone that can. Do I, I, that went, I went. I went. I went to. Uh, no, no. I'm a man. Is I went to. Um, 
I wouldn't call. Uh, I didn't white knuckle it. You know, white knuckle it. Yeah, just stop it cold. Yeah, I, I didn't white knuckle it. Well, drop it cold. Some people. Some people, I mean, I imagine there's people out there that could do it and drop yeah, a call and not have to go to meetings and all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, that, uh, I had to inv- replace that time with, uh, other activities and that other activities was going in meetings, doing meditation, working out a little more. I worked out a lot. I was working so, out like 20 hours a week. It's repositioning purpose. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and I, uh, and uh, oh my God! With all that time, I invented binge eating. Incredible amounts of food. Yeah. I mean, the really bad food too. But I was working out. You know, I go to the gym for three hours. Yeah. So I can eat a bag of donuts, um, a frozen pizza at the end of the night, uh, a cherry pie. Yeah. Not that little. What? Not the little hand one either. You know? No. You, why? Don't. Yeah, yeah. That's just. Uh, a, that's. I would get the little uh, pizza rolls. As an hors d'oeuvre, so I can <laughs> wait for the frozen food to be ready. And then, and then I started cooking. I started really getting um, creative. I said, you know, I'm just going to make, I'm going to make for whole meals. And I had, well, I mean, I got together and it, that changed my life too. So that, uh, that idea, when I, on Sunday, I'm looking at the person. Right. And I go, wow. Even now, after all those things I did, if I had the whole weekend off with everyone else, because everything else involved. Now, on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, there's a whole lot of things to do down here that don't involve drinking. There's all kinds of stuff throughout the week that I don't know, but the drinking. population, your, your people, you know, a lot of them are going to be drinking. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's the time they do it. Okay. So, so, so what I'm saying on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday is more like family time for me. So, so you hold back. Yeah. That's fine. And plus, you manage, you manage your drinking. Um, cause I'm guessing because there's a past where you did not manage it so well and it, it took, extreme. no, there are, there, there are days where I wish I could just, uh, you know, I would today wishing and doing are two different. Yeah, yeah, things. no, 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 no. I, I did. I, I, uh, like I would today. I, I went to get a haircut, and I, I go. Uh, I was. I eventually called you, but I went to get a haircut, and and, and I'm going to talk about that. That was an interesting thing because I want to talk about it real quick. But I went to this uh, Win Dixie because everyone said, "Oh, they got a liquor store in there and stuff like that," and I figured I'd get something to, food for lunch and. Uh, I went and did that, but I went in the liquor store. I'm taking a look around, taking a look around. I'm looking at bottles. Oh, they got a good price on bourbon and all that stuff. I love bourbon, but I go, I walked out of there and I had plenty. I mean, had money, I had my card and all that stuff like that. And they Just go, good. Didn't, didn't hit me. I go and, and walk in. I go, but I did go and get steaks and a potato. And uh, so I'd opt for that. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, so and last week I went and I walked out with four bottles, and you know I hardly drink, mm-hmm. but. There's some things that any good bar should have. Yeah. Especially being an Italian, um, you need your coffee liquors. Yeah. And your cream coffee liquors to go with your espresso. Uh huh. If you want to give it a good jolt. And then, of course, my Basil Hayden's. I had to have my, uh, my bourbon. Oh, really? Because when I, when I, uh, when I drink, I drink basically two drinks. Right. Maybe three, if I'm really feeling... An old-fashioned? No, no, no. That was my dad's favorite oh, drink. Okay. Um, he was a bartender, as, uh-huh. a, as a matter of fact. Uh-huh. Uh, he couldn't drink it because uh, of his brain injury. He'd, he'd drop dead uh-huh. if he uh, had any hard alcohol. That kept him kind of sober his oh, whole wow. life. So, um, which was good because I understand he was quite the party animal growing up. Mm-hmm. And then the war happened and he came home and that... That had to stop. So wow. he had no choice in making that transition. But um, if I don't have a Bloody Mary, then my two go-tos are a Campari mm-hmm. um, or uh, whoa, whoa. bourbon and Coke. But it's got to be uh, – I, I can't drink like well bourbon. That just doesn't happen um, if it's like Jack or, you know, Jim Beam. The, the basics – uh, I can't do it. it. It's rot gut. It just makes my stomach go how sour. About, how about like... Uh, uh, Has to be high end. Like Makers. Makers... Um, no, okay. It, it cuts, Woodford? No, how about no. Woodford? Woodford's a little smoother. Makers 
bites when I drink yeah. it, I get a really hard bite out of it, and it's not enjoyable. Yeah, it smells great. How about Blanton's? Never had it. Blanton's, but right. Basil Hayden's. I tried that uh, about six months ago. My brother mm-hmm. had it, um, and um, it's like a single barrel. It, mm-hmm. It's really smooth. So, and you know, the other thing is, when I was a kid, I came down here. Yeah. Um, mind you, I was a child, five years old. We're going down yeah. to uh, Whale Harbor. Um, some of you who are down here who listen may may know Skip Bradeen. He's kind of a fixture. Yeah, he has a radio um, show down here. And all yeah, that. he's uh, he's quite the character. But I, on and off, I've been fishing with Skip Bradeen for since I was five years old, mm-hmm. and um, that relationship sort of um, popped up again. You know, when you're five to say ten, mm-hmm. and then. Nothing. You kind of forget. And then uh, when I was in my uh, mid to late 20s, a buddy of mine booked a fishing trip, and it just happened to be on Blue Chip 2, Skip Brading. Mm -hmm. And I kept looking at him, thinking, and he remembered my uncle, the ice cream guy. My uncle uncle has an ice cream company. And uh, so we started that connection again. And, you know, Skip's a wonderful person, but enough about Skip, more about me. So... But coming down here as a kid, then coming down here really a lot uh, in my early and uh-huh. late 20s, and then working down here in my late 40s as yeah. a trooper, my 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 perception and expectation of, of the keys yeah. shifts. As a kid, I thought this place was like driving on the road to the Bahamas. It was somewhere, n- it, it was magical. Oh, yeah. It was uh, it was entering a fantasy because yeah. at five, six, seven years old, you're going from the truck into a boat into crystal clear blue, yeah. blue and emerald green water, uh, and catching really neat fish. And so, and everyone's laughing now. Now the adults, thank God, you know, I grew up. Everyone had a scotch, yeah, in their hands, but um, but no one, no one would have thought, especially if they were driving, that they're going. They're going that even then, they knew you mm-hmm. can't drive screwed up. Then in my in my twenties, it was all about let's go to the keys and get fucked up, uh-huh. because one, it was not near home, yep. right? And you get with your your buddies, you know, whether coworkers or mm-hmm. high school friends, and you come down here. But it was strange. We we'd go eat, yep, and then we'd go drink, and and and, and someone had to be responsible to drive us home, and that was always worked out. And this is before the big push for. You know the DUI in the uh-huh. '80s and st- in the in the mid '80s. It was just how else are you going to get home? We got to get home. You know, we're going to get. We all live with our parents at the yeah. time, and no one wanted to face that music. So then, by the time I'm in my 40s and I'm working here, mm-hmm. I'm back to wow. There's a lot of neat stuff to do in the Keys. Now that I live here, it's the same thing. There's so much to do here uh-huh. that drinking just interferes with. Oh, cause you go out on the boat and having, I don't mean like having a uh-huh. drink, drinking. I mean, drinking to get screwed up, uh-huh. drinking to get drunk. There's too many things to do. There's too many things to appreciate. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where the problem is. You know, we have a lot of issues with people coming down from Miami who use the keys, yeah. trash it and go home. And, and, and that could be said for any tourist, I suppose. Any place. Any place. Well, yeah, you're right. Because I've seen, Everest. I've seen horror Look at Mount stories. Everest, the shit I, they leave up there, the yeah, human yeah, yeah. waste and oh, body. That, that was phys- really, man, did human. you see that? The amount of waste on Everest? Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah, there's tons of waste. It's tons. So I've seen horrible things throughout Europe where you're, you're, you're somewhere where, the, you know, it's 2,500 year old. I know, the Coliseum. The, co- the Coliseum, there's people, burger wrappers on the ground. Yeah, ex- or they're pissing on the walls. Yeah. You know, I mean, please. So yeah, but. But that's my point. You're coming somewhere that has such natural beauty. Yep. Really, that's the selling point of the Keys, isn't it? Yep. You come here to fish, to snorkel dive, to boat. It's the environment that is the draw. Yeah, there's some industry down here, but this place makes its money on visitors. Mm -hmm. And visitors drink and visitors eat as well as participate in those companies that take them fishing and diving yep. and all the rest of it. 
But sometimes those visitors, when I was working here as a sergeant uh-huh. for the highway patrol, you, you, you just had to ask yourself, why'd you bother to come down here? If you're, ready to do that. you're, you're drunk three days of the, of the three you're here. And didn't you, you didn't think that one through, you know, you're going to go home and say, what? I got fucked up. So here's, here's my problem. Your expectation is to go on vacation to get fucked up. There's other problems in your life. So as just my question would be, what's being avoided? Mm -hmm. What isn't being dealt with that this behavior continues? And and how scary is that thing that's not being dealt with that forces or compels someone to say, yeah, but being inebriated for three days really was the best? Well, I mean, that that's uh, the, the self-medicating thing where, yeah, we yes, exactly the way I did it. When you go and you're, you're you just want to forget oh, I, what your exactly. life is, your life is like back in the real world and stuff like that. When that happens, you could do that at home. See, no, I didn't. You I, could do I, that I at home. Something and, out. You could do that at home in a yes, bar. You can. Yeah. But yeah. I left something out. So what? the listeners, they may have heard this from my, from me before when I was in my twenties. See, when I was in my late forties, I, I, I came out of the closet yeah. at 47. Yeah. And even before that, I was starting to see with different eyes. Yeah. And you talked about a time where you got, you, you avoided drinking. Wait a second. Out. You know what? But I, I want to do it. a whole show on this. Okay. But let me, can just, we have a moment? Can yeah. we do it? No, I want to do, I want to, uh, we're going to end this. No, we'll just continue. We'll Let's do another going. pause. No, do a pause. And you're going to tell a whole story on that because we've got to do 20 minute. I'm not going to, I'm not going to accidentally drop this one again. Okay. <laughs> You know, listeners, there's some things that you have to spend more time with. And I thought it was an injustice if we I needed to take another 20 minute break. And I'll just put this in. This is going to be an hour long show because you're getting to a point that I don't think you could just gloss over and do it in 10 minutes or five minutes. Even I thought that the 20 minutes. So I I saw where you were getting at. Mm -hmm. So that that's uh Keenly interesting inside of look. When you were in your, 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 when did you become a state trooper? Uh, I was, uh, 22 years old, 1980, 23 years. Yeah, 22. Okay. 1986. Yeah. And I don't need to know about your experience. It's not that if you want to talk to them, that's fine. But so at the time, you're, you're, I mean, I imagine that's a, that's a culture thing where they didn't put up with any, it, it was kind of intolerant. Towards oh no, stat. Listen, the, it, you have two things going on. Yeah. You have a high incidence of alcohol, uh, al- alcoholism in law enforcement. Yeah, maybe less so on the patrol. Uh huh. Um, just because it's really your urban city cops that are the, the in and out of seeing the same senseless abuse, same senseless victimization, in and out. It takes a toll on you. Yeah. It takes not as fast a toll. But let me tell you what can happen on the patrol. And usually does. Um, and you're always working against your own image, right? Mm-hmm. The big state trooper working yeah. the lonely road. So, and that's seeing your first dead body or your first dead child or, or a dismembered body or a burned body. And that alters you. Uh-huh. Um, but the image on the patrol is that, that let's just not talk about that. Tomorrow's another day. Mm-hmm. Pat you on the shoulder. My son was dying and I got the same attitude when my son passed. Hey, tomorrow's a better day. Yeah. You don't fuck you. Tomorrow's a better day. I just lost my son in my arms. You fuck. But to, but that's the culture, and the culture is this hurts too much. I just don't want to involve myself in your issues. Mm-hmm. So you're on your own, and everyone's on their own. And then you have this feeling of loneliness. It's a perceived feeling. Are of you being drinking on your a lot, Dornis? You know, when I was a trooper, um, no. No, well, um, I mean, what, what my drinking like leading up to being a trooper, you know, I drank. Uh, so, but you're coming out, you're, you're, you, 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 you were, you're having feelings, right? Yeah, of course. So you didn't have any issues with uh, alcohol because of that? No, no, no. I, um, I just sublimated it all. I internalized it. I pushed it down. My, where it came out. Were you raised Catholic? Oh, yeah. Of oh, that sucks. Yeah, of course it sucks. And then went to the evangelical church. 
It's even worse. That's even worse. So talk about guilt, shame. I know you have a uh, we, here and, here we here we have a large a largely gay clergy telling yeah. you that you're evil. And uh, I mean, I okay. right? Yeah, and and then you go to uh, uh, the evangelicals and telling you're going to go to hell. You're the reason why right. the world's bad. I remember two guys that walked into my uh, evangelical church uh-huh. growing up, and uh, two gay men. Yeah, as it turned out, and, and they honestly they didn't. They were Christians. Uh-huh. They believed. They didn't know how to manage those beliefs in light of what people were saying. That as gays, you're you're going to rot in hell and you're evil and they were, that's their theology. So they found themselves. That was their theology, right? They, they should have went to a Methodist church or something like that. They didn't know. They were seeking. Okay, so let's let's use uh, the speak of the church. Yeah, and then we'll get back to drinking. The speak of the church is you're seeking. It's your path. It's a very Eastern yep. philosophy, right? Yeah. When it's convenient. Yeah. And that they ended up throwing these two out of the church in the most vile way shaming them and guilting them and it was the most it was the worst thing i'd ever seen and that, that was, was it was w- it a process or was it over no. one meeting instantly once they found out they were gay no one asked any questions they were on the street that was the last day i went to church oh. i told my parents this is not how this started with the church i was preaching at 12 years old in coconut uh-huh. grove on the street corners to vietnam vets uh-huh. it was the greatest exhibition of love and transformation, as it turns out, as I grow up older, transformation could be achieved in so many ways. It's not just the word of Jesus Christ. It's it's the word of love yeah. and acceptance and forgiveness. And I watched these, these men who had horrible pasts, many of them alcoholics uh-huh. and drug addicts. They just needed to be told oh, they, okay. they were loved. Okay. Let me bring you back on this path here. You're a trooper. I thought you were going to start telling me, and you don't have to. Are you comfortable telling? Yeah. You're 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 a trooper. You're you're going through your career. You you get you got eventually you get married, yes. have kids. But that you were talking about drinking versus some other. No, I'm only drinking one because you were talking about a thing. I thought you were. If you don't want to talk talk about dealing, you're not de- you're dealing with this. You're dealing with this without oh, drinking. My whole life, yes, without drinking. But it showed up in another way. That's pretty amazing, though. Without drinking, you no. Know, I mean, because that could that, that would lead to other devastations that go on. I, and stuff one, like I could never be a trooper, obviously, if I if that problem showed up early on. Yeah. And my drinking when I was younger was the typical exploratory oh, you mean, there's drinking. No, there's no troopers that have drinking problems. There are troopers that have drinking problems, and those are issues that they're dealing with. Yeah. Or the the root cause of the drinking. There was plenty. Issue. Yeah. I'm just speaking for myself. There, I mean, it, it crosses. It as crosses. Far, my yeah. story is. I'm a closeted homosexual yeah. who knew he was attracted to the same sex when he was 12. When you were 12, you knew? Yes. Yeah. So going through life was a, a means of managing. So you knew you were, you knew when you were 12, you knew gays exist when you were 12. No, I knew I, I liked other men. So other when boys. did you realize that that was a option? Like when, when you, when did you come to the realization that that, that does exist? Oh. And, it's not, and did you have, Negative stereotypes of those people. Yes, absolutely. You did? That's kind of like yeah. self-hating. Could be. Self-hating. Okay. Could be. So, but it progressed and you came and you started seeing the hypocrisy. I mean, I don't want to put masks on that. Here's, you saw the hypocrisy of religion on uh, that preached love and acceptance right. and this. And they threw out the two, two guys. And you were how old when that happened? Uh, when they threw them out? 19. Yeah. Okay. So you knew... Yeah, and you saw, hey, these guys were nice. I saw me in them. Yeah. I saw the look. I was already in law enforcement, and what I saw was a look of help. They, they need, they was a cry for help. And this, and this church threw them on the street. And, and, and uh, the subject matter, as we now know, is a very delicate one that usually leads to suicide. So. Yep. Shaming and, yeah. It it was the, the most brazen act of hate to people they didn't know completely counter to the very words that had just been spoken from that pulpit. Uh And I could not, nor will I ever try to mend that. It, um, it it, it is, if I have any hate in my heart, it's for, it's for the expression of quote unquote, hate in the name of religion. I have no use for it. I, that's why I'm an anti-theist. I don't think man, man's contrived, illness known as religion uh 
it will ever amount to anything other than yet another camp to join to avoid uh -huh. the real issues in your life. And yet I know plenty who keep one foot in and one foot out who use it and they manage it appropriately. And it never stops them from loving yeah. unquestionably. And I'm not speaking about them. They, it's it, be it's the idea them. of it's religion. Gotta, it's got to be really hard for those people to, that um, believe in uh, uh, acceptance and love and, and – uh, well, that's what's led the to, one human family movement. You right, know what well, I mean? That's what's led to the other other. We'll call them sects. Yeah, a humanist, a humanist, uh, uh, the, the humanist movement, right? Where it's uh, the the diffusion of empathy, where you're able to extend your sympathies from within your group, which let's say you're white Southern Baptist. And then you're, you, you said, well, they, they're the only ones going to have, and they're the only ones that matter, blah, 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 blah. This, and then you go out further, and then you have, you go and take, uh, let's say Jews, Catholics, black people, uh, Mexicans, you go further, and you diffuse the empathy among more and more, uh, groups, uh, different, uh, lifestyles, uh, uh, different nationalities. I think nationality is way down there. It's just there's a, there's a name. There's one <laughs> thing, but we, we have this xenophobia. Uh, xenophobia is not just nationalism. It happens inside groups too. Of course. Yes. Of course. So, and, and inside, uh, uh, you know, so inside the United States, you got groups of people that view themselves as a true Americans and, you know, and, and they may be, uh, they could be less than a million people or it could be more. It seems that the, the way the movements are right now, we call everyone liars and hateful and, you know, demand respect for some, somebody who There's isn't, a isn't giving respect to anybody. Right. And uh, so you're going through all this, your marriage, it's a very tough job. Well, as listen. Thing. And it, what, what's the crux at the moment where you decide, uh, I'm done? Well, the thing that would have been drinking, yeah. the drug, let's yeah. call it the drug, uh, turned out to be adrenaline. And um, it was a very useful tool yeah. uh, to become an adrenaline junkie. When you're an adrenaline, were you junkie, racing motorcycles or something? Like that? I was racing whatever I can get my hands on. Yeah. Not so much motorcycles, but cars. Yeah. Um, um, taking risks, you yeah. know, midnight dives without tanks, um, out in the ocean. Um, even if it, it just what whatever, and then if and then there was the job. This is why, I, in my heart, I always wanted to serve people, but then yeah. I realized, um. But wait, there's one particular way of serving people that really fits what I want, and it provides that adrenaline rush. Mm -hmm. And I needed that rush because something came with that rush, admiration. Mm -hmm. And if they're admiring you, they're really not seeing you. Mm -hmm. And you can hide wonderfully behind a blanket of admiration. It's much like being starstruck, right? Uh -huh. You're looking at someone only because of the image that, that, that's been on screens. Mm -hmm. You know nothing about the person you just see their face. It's very one-dimensional. What a great way to replicate that is to be a cop. But then I find myself as a cop. That's not that's not good enough because the problem with being yeah. an adrenaline junkie is you build a you build a resistance, and you need more adrenaline. Now it never ended up being alcohol, uh -huh. um, because I knew one thing that I couldn't go out at night so fucked up and keep calling in sick to work, or God forbid, show up with alcohol on my breath, I'd lose the very thing that's providing me uh -huh. the cover. And that's what it was. The adrenaline had to amp, how do I do that? All right, I'll go work that crappy neighborhood, and I'll go find those people you've been looking for that mm -hmm. no one else can go find. Mm -hmm. And you show up with them. Boom, your image goes up. And it was risky. And then I'll work. It, three years. I was on the I was on the job for three years, and they it's, they they threw the dog at me almost. You need to take this position. Why? Because my felony arrests were five and six times that people with ten and twenty years mm -hmm. on the patrol. I just went and I liked arresting people who were distributing cocaine. Yeah, it was risky. Yeah, but my attitude was. Uh, I need this. And they were found, probably more likely to be armed too, right? Highly. Oh my God. Highly. Yeah. So, um, 
it, 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 you had this constant edge for more adrenaline. Yeah. So it gets to the point where now I'm doing international drug cases and task forces. And the, it's like, I won't go too much into it, but, yeah. you know, one day my book will come out and I, I draw from this one case. It is the high point uh, where the, a, a cartel decides uh, the two troopers, me and my partner, uh, they got to go. So uh-huh. they send a hit squad to Miami to try and kill wow, us. Really? And they ended up killing five suspects. They ended up killing five. It turns out they were informants, so they had their they had the names right. But they dumped the bodies on the roads that me and my partner worked to send a message. Oh, okay. And uh, naturally, I'm still here and she's still here. So that didn't work out. We ended up arresting a kingpin and a child dies in this case. It's a nasty, nasty oh, case. Wow. And um, all, all in the... Cocaine Cowboys area? All in the co- yeah, the Cocaine Cowboys area extends well into the 1990s, probably 2000s. Because, really? yeah, with that, it's not just the cocaine. Uh, it becomes heroin, uh, even in South Florida, and it's the money. It's the money. And then moving the money is moving the drugs. Uh, sometimes that money is going offshore into boats, and it's doing yeah. a reverse course because they can't get it into banks fast enough. So it, it it's all of that. Oh, yeah. So w- then... I end up joining the union. Uh-huh. I become the president of the union. I have five laws on the books that I wrote. So what? What it kept going up? It kept on going up, but then you're 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 keeping it in, keeping it in, keeping it in. What what breaks at that time? What what what, what causes it you to come? A couple of things. I don't even say two specific. What? Um, working in Tallahassee, getting real close to management, mm-hmm. building relationships with management. Um. I could have kept being a canine until I retired. died. Yeah. Um, but I took a sergeant's position. Uh, I studied for the test. took mm-hmm. me three times. It's not unusual. Mm-hmm. The FHP supervisor's exam is not the easiest in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, third time work like a charm. Um, they wanted to put me uh, in. Uh, now, by this time, I'm married. Yeah. Okay. And I got kids. And they, they wanted to put me in marathon, which meant I couldn't live in where I was living in Homestead, I'd have to move, uh-huh. and I couldn't do that. So they did me. Why couldn't you do it? I, I, I'd have lost too much money. I had an entire oh. family. I didn't want to put the kids through that okay. either. I mean, that, this, that's an uprooting of the family to go to Marathon. Uh, no. See, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I was I'm, gonna a, turn I'm a Navy down. kid, and uh, I went to 16 different elementary right. schools. I just, I didn't, yeah, I didn't want to do that to yeah. my kids. And, uh, and my wife at the time, she... I don't think she'd have been happy living that far from her parents. And uh-huh. uh, and I don't think I would have. And my parents at that time lived in Sarasota, uh-huh. which was far enough. I didn't want to add to that. So, uh-huh. um, But they said, no, we're going to put your position in Key Largo, which means if you stay in Homestead, you're within the radius of resident being with a resident. Mm-hmm. So I was able to stay. I become a sergeant. I come to the Keys. Uh-huh. Then my son gets sick. While I'm a sergeant... There's no more adrenaline. You're simply responding to make sure troopers have what they need to get the job done. You're no longer the mm-hmm. guy doing the job. You're now a little removed from mm-hmm. it. You're a lot removed from it. So there that, there's not that. And it becomes somewhat idle time in the back of my mind. Mm-hmm. No adrenaline. And, and it, so I start working out yeah. three hours a day, running five to seven miles a day. I wear my body out. I looked good, Mm -hmm. but it wrecked me. Mm -hmm. Then my son gets sick with brain cancer. And then nothing makes sense anymore. It destroyed. I couldn't look at myself in the mirror and say, you know, what can I do to promote me Mm -hmm. to keep people from seeing me? Mm -hmm. That didn't make sense. I have a son who's shriveling up. Mm -hmm. He's not going to get better because he had two forms of brain cancer. And I knew that three days into when he got sick. Mm-hmm. And you live, I had to live for everyone else. Mm-hmm. Now, you'd have thought as a police officer, you're serving everyone else. Well, yeah, that's true. But I had another thing going on. I was serving me by serving everyone else to keep people from seeing me. And it worked well. I may be, I don't know, I refined the art, I think, in life of, I call it armor. Yeah of keeping that armor spotless, uh-huh. of, of making sure the image of, of Trooper Joe, oh, my God, you know, what'd you do today? Everyone uh-huh. would ask, well, uh, how's it going? And then 
I took the job as a sergeant. Didn't seem to have much meaning anymore. Yeah. My son gets sick and, and I, I can't, I can't keep that up. Now I'm going to tell you this and it's going to sound cruel as hell, mm-hmm. but it's honest. I think I had to make a decision. What's more important? My son, my girls, including the emotions of my wife yeah. or my fucking image. Yeah. And I, I, I voted on them and not the image. Uh huh. And then it was, it just, the, the unraveling, like, like when you burn into a golf ball, the, the, the bands just come that right out. covers it. Yep. And there was only one thing left to do at that point because the sidearm they gave me was starting to look awfully good. And I knew what that meant. You know, you can look down the road, uh-huh. especially when you're in a lament. Uh huh. And you could say, I know where this is going. If uh-huh. you're smart, there's a crossroads coming. And, and, um, if I make the wrong turn, it's a dead end and I'm mm-hmm. dead. Um, which probably explains that when you accept that, um, people who, who self demise, there's a certain peace over them, um, depending how they do it naturally. But there's a certain, you, you just get an understanding by being around someone who's committed suicide that the, whatever was going on in their life, they had to be at peace with something to do this. They, they, the pain and the anxiety and whatever led them to this at some point, they just had to be okay with the doing. And it's a, a, a relent. It's a giving away of the will to do this, to finally end the pain. And it's a weird analogy, I know, but that, that's just my experience. I, I, I understand. I, and, and like and I, 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 just in case the listeners on there, um, yeah, there, there are, People that the, the people that do not do it, they realize, and you realize today, that not doing it is much better. Oh my God! Than doing it. What a there is a resignation. There is a resignation when you do it. There is a commitment. Just like the terrorists that decide to fly a plane into a building and decide to kill three thousand people. Uh, there's resignation. Is it the right answer? And Retrospect, it is not the right answer, but, but I understand where you were coming from. Yeah, there. The pain, there certainly is resignation. And that's what we call it I, resignation. I think the people who, I know for me, I'll just use me. I won't say the people. I mean, but there's so many, it's I devastating. It's devastating. I, and, and you know what? It's weird for me to have to be the advocate for the, the closeted gay community. If you're, I mean, it's a much better now environment. Thank God for these people. Than uh, for men, women, people aren't afraid to. to yeah, speak you're, about you're, you're not you, in. In I mean, you certain very well certain get. groups of people. I imagine if you're Amish, if you're, I don't yeah. even know. I don't know what the Amish is. Uh, I don't know if they're. Hey, I don't know. I don't. No. You never know. I don't. I don't think. I don't think it's that. as big a deal as we may think for them. Yeah. Um, I've actually known a few uh, yeah. Dutch. You don't Baptist think it's a big deal. Amish. No, it wouldn't be their thing. They'd probably say, no, you can't do that. You know, it's a sin. But they don't. Whatever. But they're not going to sit there and they'll feed you if you're hungry for, yeah. for, for fuck's sake. Yeah. That's just their, their nature. Yeah. My, my realization seeing that what no. I was headed to was no. can, I can't, I can't leave. I love them too much. And I was willing. There was another way for me to end my pain. And that was simply tell the truth. And then I had to deal with the fear. Was that whirring around in your head like, oh, I'm a, I'm a, when was the thing, when was the idea, like I do affirmations, like I wrote down things like, I know what I am. I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a broadcaster, I'm a philosopher, I'm a coach, I'm a writer. This is what I believe. It doesn't matter what other people believe. And we talk about the things where people around you think you are. Which sometimes we become, right? Right. We, we try to be the things for people around us, but then you just things you know you are. Where was that point at the thing you say, even before you say you were dealing with the pain, you had these other things. When, when did there, was there a time before the time you came forward coming out where you th- said in your head, I'm a gay man? Oh, oh yeah. How long uh, before that was it? Probably in my 20s, I realized, definitely before I got married. Really? Um, And yet I fell in love with with my wife. I mean, she's no no one would not. 
fall. Well, I mean, a, I mean, that wouldn't preclude falling in love with somebody. I mean, I realize you can, but right. it's not the the relationship. It's not the uh, ideal relationship you I want did, for no, a partner. But I did fall in love with her. People say, "Well, did you really love her?" Yeah, yes. Just like uh, yes. you've seen a, a yeah. movie, The Bohemian Rhapsody. He, he right. He fucking loved that woman. No, but he really did. He, no, he did. He fucking loved he really that did. woman. I said, and like we've talked about, that was the love of his sexuality life. Sexuality right? is yeah. on a curve. Yes, and you, look, does it mean that if you're gay, you'll never think about a woman sexually? Some gay men won't. Some gay men does it's it, on does a it, curve. And it doesn't mean if you're straight, you won't think about a guy. Yeah, with the same sex. Yeah, yeah, of course. So, so we always have to yeah. remind ourselves to get away from that. That monosyllabic view of, of sexuality. Mm-hmm. However, um, I also knew, this is so sad, what? that the marriage would be great for the image. It's yeah, all part yeah, of it. I, Listen, I know drug uh, I told you, I said in the previous thing, it is a that, nasty that the reason drug. why I got married was that I didn't want to be the uh, old uh, drunken uncle. Right. I didn't say, I didn't say drunken uncle because they, those guys were drunken, uh, uncles. I didn't want to be that. And there was a character on, uh, there was a character on Sunday Alive. He did it for a couple of years running. It was a drunken uncle. And it's just, it was a parody of the guy who, and it's just like, uh, I we used to call, um, well, I guess in, in the form of a closet of gay man, it would be, uh, the, uh, what do they call that? Bachelor or something. Confirmed bachelor. A confirmed bachelor. Convert. That was the old style saying it. And the drunken, I mean, the well, parody of the drunken uncle. Think of it as drunken uncle. Now, the, for my thing was though I would become a person that I would never feel that anybody would want to be around eventually because you start hating yourself. Once you start hating yourself, then how could anybody love you if you hate yourself? If you can't do that, or, or you find someone that's okay with that, that you don't like yourself, and what kind of person is that good to be with? I'm not saying you. Uh, that was that's was everyone deals with differently with alcohol and stuff like that. There's self loathing and things like that, and there's other ones. The people when it comes to lifestyle choices, it's the the sinner. I'm a sinner. I'm wrong. I'm the wrong stereotype and stuff like that. Just a that stereotype that you have to be that way to cut to the core of the, the, the core of the belief is where, how we are friends. You are, you, you know, you come up to, are they good people? Right. Yes. Are they honorable? Yes. I mean, and everything kind of flows from that part. Are they good people? Are they honorable? And and you don't have to ask the next questions. Do they have my best interest? No, no they have no. their best. Well, their best interest align, align with my best interest. I have three which, core criterion for what? friends, for humans yes. in general. Yeah. Empathy, compassion, and honor. I think compassion and empathy are... No. You don't think that? No. Let me tell you something. Empathy, placing yourself in the conditions of others. In other words, your feet in the shoes of others. Yeah. Feeling how they feel. Yeah. Truly absorbing their experience and eliminating yours. That, that's a calling in and of itself. Eastern philosophies. Spend I would like to say that, but I never, working that I out. never could ever feel, uh, I, I have compassion and understanding as a, as a history for like the, uh, the history of lynching in the United States. Uh, a well known po- po- politician compared the investigations into his thing as a lynching, knowing that full well, there's a very dark history of lynching in the African American uh, community, and it's very deep wound. And to be able to use that word with not considering that, can I feel? I I do empathize, but do I fully feel what the no. full force of racism is? I I, w- I would. I don't know what it's like because I haven't haven't been in there. Because I've been. It's a journey. Yeah. To empathize with someone. You can only empathize as far as you're willing to go. Yeah. It requires you. Empathy requires you to strip you away from it. And that's easier said than done. Empathy, to develop an empathy, is to truly develop the sense that you're no longer you, that you are the other person, what? and that you can now sustain that's the feeling. That we, and, that's that we thing, which is I agree with. Yeah. I agree with. It's, it's, See, that's where compassion and empathy, I think. Compassion when, is... is I is an under is an understanding. If, if I am compassionate, so 
One but can be compassionate at the simple recognition that there's a lesser amongst us, someone who's hungry, someone who's hurt. You can have compassion. But do you, are you really putting yourself and feeling their pain, feeling their void, their loneliness? I, 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 still, I, I, view, I, I, view, I view that. Now, this is where it, it, the, the tomato, tomato thing, that if you're compassionate, your, your uh, default would be empathy. Not necessarily. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's that thing that we see with software and social media where they're linked together, where I link it together, where other people say, you know, where, you know, yeah, where yeah. empathy comes in and what? you can see it in others and where empathy, if you have empathy. If you have compassion, here's where you'll know an empathetic soul versus mm-hmm. one who's not their patience. If you have someone who's compassionate and who's exhibiting compassion and they just run out of patience, they've never put themselves in the place of that person who's hurting to know time is no longer an issue here. An an empathetic soul walks away bothered by the feelings that they, that they transmit upon themselves. I I, 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 I know someone who's just compassionate. That's great. A lot of people were charitable with compassion. But when you don't have that person walk away moved in their soul by it, they may not be empathetic. I'm losing my patience show now. (laughs) Okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But adrenaline uh, was you, my drug you, just you, to sum it no. up. And at the end, I couldn't keep it together because I had to make a, a well, higher uh, decision. And that was I couldn't look my dying yeah. child in the eye. I couldn't and think that somehow I'm going to get through this all about yeah. me and maintaining this thing, which no longer yeah. had importance. Whereas just a few months before it, it had always been the number one thing in your life. Life depended on it being the number one thing. My existence, because if anyone saw that I was gay, I'd be thrown out of the house, thrown out of the church, thrown out of life, lost the family. Now, as it turns out, a lot of that is hyperbole that I created. And that's what fear does for Mm. you. But nonetheless, it was fear. Fear, fear, fear. And we have a society that still to this day, though in a lesser degree, Mm. but still promotes you should, hey, I don't care who you are. just, Just I don't want to see you. I don't want to hear you, and you don't get to express yourself like anyone else. Just stay, in other words, stay in the closet. I accept you, just be back in the closet. No, that's not how this works. How this works is if I'm going to free myself Mm -hmm. and go through life like many people Mm -hmm. listening have been through life. Many people listening have Mm -hmm. gone through horrible things. And when you reach a truth, well, that's your truth. No one has the right to shame you, guilt you. It's your truth. You're li- if you're trying to live honestly and truthfully, mm-hmm. stand by it. Don't let anyone, including if you're thinking about, you know, I, I, I identify this way, but I'm scared. Mm-hmm. Know that there's an awful lot of people more now than ever that are willing to put their arms around you and just support you. That people are, in general, the humanist you mentioned mm-hmm. earlier, they live by one, one big, giant, number one rule. And that's the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have done unto yourself. With the caveat, some people are harmful to themselves. Do unto others as you wish to be treated. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> so if you wish to be treated well, then that's how you should treat others. Yeah. And and that's the humanist I, outlook. I, I, and, that's and, the core I, I, expression of I, being I, a human. I, I, I agree with you 100%. I'm trying not to be different. But the, some of the things today, the biggest problems are people that are not aware that they don't care about themselves enough. And I'm not talking about this white pride stuff and bullshit like that. I'm talking about not caring enough about themselves to be able to know that they could be a decent person and, and be accepting and do all these things without doing it. You know what? Uh, we're at an hour and 25 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're going to have to continue this another time. I don't mean to tell you, but I think you. I think you. I yeah, think I gotta have, go shopping. I'm out of high heels. Uh, see, that's a stereotype. Of course. <laughs> uh, the, uh, I'd like to thank pa- Papa Joe. Hello. Uh, and and uh, it's funny we did take a thing, but that's the way it is on the Keys Bartender uh, podcast. Uh, we started out getting fucked up, and uh, we we went into a, a deep conversation, much like we would at a bar. Uh, I'd like to thank Papa Joe. And uh, and Joe is drinking his Mexican Coke. 
I love my Coca-Cola. Mexican Coke, even yeah. though I'm now on a cut out the sugar binge, yeah. but not for my Coke. Yep, nope, that's good. That's good. We'll be back. Uh, we'll be back next episode. You'll be t- tonight. Sure. Why not? Okay. Talk to you later. Take care.